um, so I mean, most of you know I'm in medical school, but uh, I think the population in medical school tends to be a little more stressed than the average population, um, especially when you have exams the next week. So I've been learning a lot about not complaining and loving my neighbors, especially when I don't want to. And uh, this week God is really reminding me that, um, read a verse from Matthew, that when we seek first his kingdom, all else will be put in place. So he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And in Matthew 6 is a great chapter. I'd encourage you to read it this week, um, where God just reminds us that all the things that we think we need and that we do need for life that God will provide if we seek his kingdom first. Um, and so that was a big reminder to me this week that like my first job is to love my neighbor and to love God and all the all else will come into place so i just want to remind you all as we sing lord i need you that we would remember that christ is number one in everything whether at school or work um or family even that god is still number one so um let's just worship together and put our hearts before him this morning While we were uh, we prayed this morning, and while we were in there, I was thinking um, about I I met some uh, some younger uh, great aunts or great cousins that I had uh, yesterday, and um, they were a real encouragement to me. They told me uh, some of the stories that they went through, and 
and everything. And they told me a, a story of, of Papa. I don't really know who Papa is, but it's their grandfather. And they told the story of how he, uh, one night he stayed up all night praying for one of their, their children who wasn't saved. And the next morning he told his wife that not to worry about Everett, the son that they prayed for, that God had told him that he would be saved. And about three, uh, three months later he, was, he got saved. Um, and so I, I thought about how he would stayed up praying and he heard from, from God that not to worry he was going to be saved. And he felt the presence of God. Another story they told me of how um, there was someone praying. Uh, it was a different family member. And um, the, the wife and kids came home, and he said, uh, don't do anything, just sit. The Holy Spirit is here. Don't disturb him. Don't let him go. And I've, I thought in my life that there's, there's been uh, times that I've known the Holy Spirit was there. And there's been times that I've known Satan was there. Uh, I want to start with two, um, two times when I've known for sure that Satan was there. One time when we went to Morocco, we were there during Ramadan. And uh, there was one night we, we went to bed to, to go to sleep and we couldn't. We felt just this um, uh, oppression on us. And so we got up and we walked around the, uh, the flat that we were staying in. And we went from one room to the next and we were praying uh, that God would cleanse the house and uh, remove the spiritual oppression from there. And when when we went through the, out the whole house, uh, there a burden was lifted, a, an oppression, a weight was lifted off of our shoulders. Another time we were in college, and I was asleep, and I woke up just kind of stark w- woken up, and I knew that Satan was there. He, he was just there. And... I don't know what he was doing, but I just knew he was there. And I, all, all I really remember is saying, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. And he was gone. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, but he was gone. And I just remember those two times that Satan was definitely there. Satan's always around uh, looking for that opportunity to come into your life. But there's also the Holy Spirit's always around, and he's also looking for that, that opportunity to be around. Uh, the two uh, most memorable times um, that I just, I really felt the, the Holy Spirit on me it was one time during a, a class, it was actually a lecture, and the, uh, the professor was telling us about um, kind of revival that he went through while he was in, uh, in Bible college. And just as he spoke and as he was telling us, I just kind of felt the Lord saying, this is what I want with you. I want this with you. And so I went home. I, I went to my uh, the closet. That's where I went to pray when I just wanted to be alone. And uh, I had a, a most wonderful time with God. Um, I remember there was times that I, I, I sat there and I was, I was crying and then just a little bit later, I was I was singing, <laughs> and then I would go back to to crying, and I I can't really explain it, but I know that the Holy Spirit was right there, and He wants that with me. And then the 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 last time, it was during a church service, and uh, a guy that I really respect, I really love, he was speaking, and he's maybe not a really good speaker. But when he spoke, I, and everyone else felt it, I, I have some friends, and we were talking about it, and they all knew that the Holy Spirit was there. And he was speaking, and he finished his message, and I know I felt this way, and I know other people felt this way, that we just wanted to continue on, that we knew the Spirit was there, and we wanted to continue on, but someone stood up and, and ended the service. And when the service ended, so did the Holy Spirit. He left. He, he was still there, but we just, it wasn't the same. And I know if we'd have just kept on singing praises, if someone else would have gotten up and testified or whatever, 
he would have stayed there that whole time. But we have that opportunity to just end the service. But if we don't end the service, he's willing to stay with us. And so those are a couple of times that I just remember that, you know, those stories that as they told me those stories, it it was a real encouragement because it because it brought stories back to my mind that I knew that God was there with me and I knew that God wants to have a relationship with me. Thank you. Let's continue worshiping together. I'd like to invite my dad up for the uh, main sermon. Good morning, everybody. It's a joy to be here today. and I thank the Lord for the opportunity to come in um, and praise him and be in his presence. And I thank the Lord for the worship team reminding us that we are here to sing Hosanna in the highest. I thank the Lord for that and I pray that he will guide us all as we seek his will 
and as we praise his name. The, um, the subject of my sharing today is taking it to the next level. It's a very popular term that we come across many times, and I came across it um, very graphically last year. Uh, many of you know that I uh, practice to go on a bicycle, that I go on the MS-150, and I've been doing that for quite a few years. And the Lord has given me quite a few points that I can share with you. Well, I count myself as a veteran, and I've done it seven or eight years at least. I'm good, I know it, I've, I think I've mastered it. Until last year, when I joined a new team, because I, I moved companies, so I moved to that company's team. So we arrive in Lagrange, or I arrive in Lagrange that day, the first day. For all those who don't know, it's Houston, Lagrange the first day, and then Lagrange, Austin the second day. So I arrived in Lagrange, and I get to the company's tent, and I felt very good, because the, the tent takes about 70 people, and there was only about 15 or 20 there. I felt, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm in, in, in the leaders. Until I sat down with two of my friends who were there, and they were having a snack. And this was like about 2.20, 2.25 p.m. In the, in the afternoon. And I asked them, what time did you arrive? And they said, noon. Now, we'd all started in the same time, same place, like 7 a.m. So that put me in my place. And I looked at them, and these are two colleagues I appreciate. They're about my age. They're busier than me because one of them it happens to be the, my boss and the assistant department head. And the other one is the department head. So I had no excuse. And I started thinking, what is it that these guys do that I don't? And over the next few weeks, one of the first things I did is I changed the group of people I train with. I've been training with a number of very good friends ever since I started, and I got into the point where it was almost boring. Because I knew, I mean, again, to be fair, those friends are older than me, significantly older in one case. And so I talked with these other guys, and they train in Sugarland. I said, can I join you? He said, sure. I said, I am going to hold you back. I'm going to be the trailing one. You know, in bike, biking, the person in the front does the most effort, and those who track him behind him can do the same speed with maybe 10, 20% less effort. And what people do is they rotate. And I said, I'm going to draft unashamedly. I'm the only place I'm going to be in is right behind you all the time until I get to the point where I can get it to you. And they said, fine. And I almost died the first few times. And I'm still the laggard, and I am still the person who rides the last with them. And in fact, the last few miles when we're almost back home, they go, and leave me behind. And then the other thing I realize is I can't expect to keep doing the same thing and get a different result. So I go on the bike machine once a week, and I realize, you know what, I've got to do something different. So subject to my heart rate not going above the red and bright yellow zone, I'm saying, okay, every, every 10 minutes I'll go ramp up for a few minutes and back down, catch my breath, and so on. And hopefully, in a few weeks' time, when I go on MS-150, I'll, I'll see the difference. I don't expect to still be up with my two friends, but maybe in a year or two I'll get there. And the question occurred to me yesterday as I was huffing and puffing on the bike machine and asking the Lord for inspiration on what I want to share today is how do I take it to the next, next level with my faith? Yeah? And I guess the first thing is, as a Christian, what am I aiming for? If I don't know what my target is, how do I know that I can get closer to it, or what do I aim for? Now, there are many places in the Bible that tell us that we are, a, we, you know, we are seeking perfection. Uh, we know the only time when we're going to get perfection is 
when we join the Lord in his, in his perfection in heaven. So I'm not aiming for perfection. I want to get there as, as close as I can, but saying I want to be as close as I can to perfection is not a specific target. So looking at the word of the Lord, if we look at 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, that gave me a good target to aim for. And this is Apostle Paul, near to the end of his days on earth. And he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. Now the interesting thing there is, it is still not a specific target, but is the knowledge, the certainty that you have been doing your outright best. That you know whenever, whether it's tomorrow, or with God's grace another 40, 50 years time, that I have done that. I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. When you run the race, you run as fast as you can. You don't kind of amble along and enjoy the scenery. It gives a sense of urgency. It gives a sense of, I've got to do more. I can do more. What is it more that I can do? So the answer is, or well, the question comes up from that is, how do I take stock? I need to take stock of, I know where I want to be. I need to take stock of where I am at now, today, to see what I can do about it. And this is where the examination comes, and nobody likes being examined. Okay? But if you look at 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 13, 5, the Lord says, Examine yourselves. To see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus, Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail that test. So before we start talking about, I want to do more, I want to do better, I want to be better. Let's ask ourselves a fundamental question. Am I in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And this is especially valid for those of us who have grown up in the church. We've been here all along. We've known it all our times, all our lives. I think it's worth once in a while asking that question. Where am I in the faith? Because without that, nothing else matters. If I am not on the right track, does it matter how fast I'm going? I need to be sure I am on the right track. I need to be sure that I've committed myself to my Lord Jesus Christ and that he is in me. Because without that, I'm missing the whole point. And without the presence of Jesus Christ in my life, I have no energy. I'll run out very, very quickly. So that's the first question. The second examination is even tougher. I mean, none of us, including me, I hate going to the doctor for my annual medical exam. Okay? And all you potential doctors and actual doctors, you know it. Because you hate going to the doctor for your medical exam. Okay? Because we know for sure they're going to find things that we didn't know about. Or even worse, things that we knew about and pow, neglected it. Right? And much as we respect doctors, and much as modern technology and knowledge is fantastic, they can miss things too. And sometimes you hope the doctor misses that. Okay. Well, David, in Psalm 26.2, took the plunge. And he said, Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. That's a tough one. I need to, now that I know the Lord Jesus is in me, 
I need to submit myself to the Lord and say, Lord, you test me. The Lord knows me. I know that. What he is saying is not just that, and this is me talking now, is saying, having tested me, show me where I fall short. That's the real implication. Because we all know the Lord knows us, knows our heart, knows our mind. So when King David is saying, Lord, test me, he's saying, give me the outcome of that test. That's tough. I need to open up myself, frankly, to the Lord, not just to test me, but to tell me the result of that test. That's where the toughest part is. Test me, O Lord. Test my heart and my mind, the two together. Okay, so having done that, where's my basis? We all have finite resources, we all have finite time, we all have finite money, we maybe all have finite energy. And the question that comes when I say I want to say I want to go to the next level, and the Lord Jesus asks us that question, says this is Matthew six, nineteen to twenty one. He's saying, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So having done all of those examinations, the question I need to ask myself is, where is my treasure? For some people, giving the tithe is easy. Okay, I've done the 10% or whatever, I'm off the hook. No. Where is my treasure? Some people struggle with tithing. How about things that are never replaced? How about time? Some of us have a lot of money. Some of us, Lord willing, will have a lot of money. Some of us don't, but it's finite. But all of us have 24 hours a day. That's limited. How am I spending that? What am I doing with that time? Lord, if I am spending three hours reading the newspaper, or watching TV, or playing a sport, and none of these are a bad thing. Maybe I need to dedicate some of that to you, Lord. Where is my treasure? Where is the thing that I value most? And if it is not the Lord, then Lord, guide me how I can reallocate some of that to you. Now, you could argue that we all have only 24 hours a day. I will only have X dollars a week or a month or whatever. Where's my limit? What do I do? How do I calibrate myself? Well, one answer clearly is what the Lord is telling us. <coughs> <coughs> But the other is all those the Lord has brought in around us. A good example is my two friends on the cyclists. I see them, I see what they're doing, I see what they're achieving, and I say, why not me? If that is truly what, the, what I want to do, they're doing it. Now I have another friend, and he is a, uh, an Ironman computer. Again, he's about my age. For those of you who don't know, Iron Man is 120 miles on the bicycle, a full marathon on foot, and four miles swimming one after the other, right after the other. Okay? So, when we look at those around us, and we're inspired by them, we need to have a sense of proportion. I am not going to feel guilty about saying, no way am I wanting to be an Iron Man. But the point is that those around us, especially at church, give us inspiration. When I look at 
Brother Shaddy, when he compiles songs, when he leads worship, when he stands here and teaches the Bible, when I look at so many of the sisters here, I look at their faith and their dedication. I say, why can't I do that? I'm inspired by it. I'm not going to be a Shaddy or a Lamia or an Ellen or so many of the others, but the presence of so many brothers and sisters around me should act as inspiration, saying, John, you can do more for the Lord. You can do more. You can do better. Proverbs 27.17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And that's where the beauty comes. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to be interacting with each other, sharpening up each other, encouraging each other, so that we all, individually and collectively, can go up to the next level. And we all support each other when one of us falls. And we will. We'll stumble, we'll fall. And having the Lord give us each other is part of his will for us. So we need to sharpen each other. Good. So now I've done all of that. Now what do I do next? I don't know. Pray. Ask. Ask the Lord, Lord, what more? I feel I'm not doing enough. I feel I'm not yet anywhere near where you want me to go. Where do you want me to go? Be careful. I've shared it with many people before. Be careful what you ask for. You may get it. Be prepared for the answer. Because many times the answer is totally different from what you expected. Totally out of your comfort zone. Right? Well, how else are we going to grow? It is not John giving 2x percent instead of x percent of tithing, or two times ceremonies, or two times sermons, I mean, sorry. No, more is not necessarily better. We need to ask the Lord. We need to say, Lord, I am here, I am listening. You tell me what you want me to do. And I cringe because I've done that and I've gotten answers I didn't enjoy. The Lord said, you're asking. Okay, now let's see you do it. And similarly, talk to other people, you know, the Lord has put in your life. Spouses are a tremendous source. Be careful what you ask. Leaders in the church. There's nothing wrong at all with going and saying, Pastor Asam, Pastor Asa. The Lord has put on my heart, how can I do more? What can I do? Ask them. They'll pray for you. And sometimes the Lord may have already given them something for the next person who asks, saying, okay, here's what I want that person to ask. Ask. And be prepared to accept the answer and act on it. Finally, as people who believe in grace, and as people who believe in faith, and as people who believe that's nothing I do that guarantees my salvation, I need to be very careful in thinking that what I do, I've done more than you or you, and therefore I'm better. I need to be careful that I don't spend so much time serving the Lord that I forget about the Lord. That I'm being so busy with so many church things, I forget my time with the Lord. I forget my prayer. I bend rules because that's objective. No. At the end of the day, I can only go to Jesus as our perfect example. And this was given to us very early, and it was used as a prediction of what the Lord Jesus, the perfect follower, and the perfect example is. And this is in Psalms 40, 6-8. And it says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced, 
Burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is written in my heart. Now, I'll be arrogant if I said this applies directly to me. It certainly applies to each one of us and was used as a prediction that the Lord Jesus Christ came and he was a perfect example of doing the Lord's will. And the exhortation there and the warning is, yes, I want your offerings. I want your sacrifices. I want your service. Above all, I want those to be as a result of a broken heart and a result of memorizing and having my law and my will on your heart. So whenever I go to say, Lord, I want to do more, I want to go up to the next level, I need to first say, Lord, what is your will for me? Lord, break my heart that maybe the things I'm doing with a good intention are not what you had in mind for me. Continue doing them until the Lord shows me what more or what else he wants me to do. And I need to be ready to give up things that I treasured, maybe because now they become an idol for me. And above all, I need to be ready to say, Lord, I asked, you told me. Okay, I will do it. Let's pray. Lord, I praise you, Lord. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I sing Hosanna in my heart for you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the time you've given us together. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we're going to have to share in your table, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you promised us that you are here in our middle. Grant us, Lord, that we open up our hearts and our minds, that we may enjoy you more and serve you more and grow more in our faith, in our following of you, and in our testifying for you. I thank you, Lord, for those blessings and for the challenges that come with them, knowing, Lord, that it's your strength above all that gets us there. I thank you and I ask for all this. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.